so I want to uh, introduce our uh, illustrious unpanelists. Um, oh, I had slides for all this. Oh well. Um, here, let's let's do it. Why not? Share screen. And advanced. There we go. And center that. And there we go. Um, so uh, first, I want to introduce um, Ariel Garden, who has been a longtime supporter of consciousness hacking and one of the pioneers in the space. She's donated more muses to my Stanford classes and to consciousness hacking than we can count. She's the chief evangelist and co-founder of Interaxon, the company behind the Muse uh, headset. And um, she's, she's really um, one of the people who has helped to define and create the space of uh, technology-assisted meditation and transformative technology. Uh, and and Ariel, can I can I get you to? I'm going to actually stop the sharing. Ariel, can I get you to just say hi so people can see your face? Hello, thank you, Mikey. As always, this is an amazing conference, and thank you, everyone. This is incredible and wonderful to see everyone here. Beautiful, thank you, Ariel. Um, Kat Connor is executive director of the Orn Project, a nonprofit incubator for organizations building equitable, affordable psychedelic medicine for all, and part of the team with Tim Chang, who gave our keynote yesterday. Kat is a psychotherapist, facilitator, and experiential educator, currently being trained in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy and with MAPS to become an MDMA for PTSD therapy provider. Kat, can we get a little wave hello from you so people can see you? Hello, it's lovely to be here with all of you and thank you all for creating such an incredible and dynamic offering for us to come together during these times. Beautiful, thank you, Kat. Vincent Horn, you might know him as the founder of Buddhist Geeks, and he's part of a generation of teachers, facilitators, and translators bringing Dharma to life. He holds one of the deepest perspectives on technology and meditation in the space and has been deeply involved from the beginning. A little factoid, the very first interview I ever did, which was such a big deal for me, was on the Buddhist Geeks podcast, which really was the very first source of information, interviews, content in the space. Go check out the Buddhist Geeks podcast archives. It's freaking amazing. Um, and then, uh, Vincent, Vince, are you here? Can you get a hello? And he's probably trying to unmute himself or something like that. Vince. Okay. We'll give him a, okay. We'll give him a, we'll come back to Vince. Um, uh, Janice Phelps, um, is the director of the, uh, CIIS Center for Psychedelic Therapies and has um, been a professor at CIS for the last 22 years and is really at the leading edge of training therapists for when psychedelics um, become legal as they are becoming legal. Um, I am so happy that Janice is in this role from knowing her being on the board of directors for CIS, so being kind of like an official advocate for CIS. Um, there's sometimes when you see someone at the helm of something and you just breathe a sigh of relief, like, oh, I'm so glad that person's in charge. And I feel that way with, with Janice. And so I wanna welcome all four of you here. Vince, did we ever get you unmuted? Mikey, just to let you know, Janice got kicked out um, by her internet. So she's trying to get back on. Okay, cool. And what about Vince? Hey, I'm here. There Good he to is. see you all. It's so lovely to be here. All right. We got, we got three out of four. I'm, I'm going to trust. I think Janice is going gonna, is gonna to make it. So um, we're going to go and order the intros. And so um, Kat, would you start and try to keep your, your best job at keeping timing um, three minutes, please. Great. I'm actually even going to time myself. <laughs> oh, there's a pro right there. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see if I can look down and follow. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm actually going to start I, with the question. Kat, do you, do, you, do you want me to read your question for you or do you have it? I have it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll start with the question and end with the question. What are the greatest potential benefits and dangers of AI facilitated psychedelic journeys? And to talk about this, first of all, I'll say I'm, uh, I, I don't know that much about AI. So part of what I'm excited about is to bring other people in who have different um, intersections of knowledge to talk about this. Um, but from that place, whatever we're talking about, I will say that we have an opportunity here to um, really centralize the flourishing of human life. And from that vantage point, let's just like actually break down the terms, right? So a facilitated psychedelic, uh, a psychedelic journey, what do we mean by that? 
um, let's just say, let's make it narrow to the actual experience of a facilitated psychedelic journey through AI. And what do we mean by artificial intelligence? That is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech, recognition, decision-making, and translation between languages. So we all have some experience of this, right? We've got Alexa, we've got um, self-driving uh, capacities that are coming in, but what are the potential intersections here with, um, with psychedelic journeys? And what are the opportunities here um, to, let me back up. Deep learning. Sorry, you guys, totally, totally, totally ruining this. No, it's great, Kat. Actually, I, I would, I'd be curious to ask you, ask you a question. Yeah, uh, please do. Now, for the first thing I want to say is Kat is doing the right thing because the questions that are being asked here are questions that we specifically don't have an answer for. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea of the questions that are being chose, chosen. And I think Kat is going out of her comfort zone as a psychedelic therapist, asking a question, which is probably very uneasy for her. Mm -hmm. And so Kat, I would, I would throw a question at you. What, what is the thing you're most concerned about at the prospect of mm -hmm. a, a real AI completely independently leading a psychedelic therapy without a human. What most concerns you about that? Well, I think that's the challenge because trying to pose a question and I've been sitting with this and really looking at how many different avenues and places that AI, because it's such a big term AI and there's so many ways that it's already influencing our healthcare, our daily life. Um, but to really try to narrow it down to this kind of the vision of like, take her the movie what does it mean when we're developing attachments to um, these artificial beings if we accept that we as human beings need attachment biologically to flourish as humans? But at the same time, I had actually prepared a joke, um, which has been going around in COVID times, which is, this morning I saw a neighbor talking to her cat. It was obvious she thought her cat understood her. I came into my house, told my dog, we had a good laugh. <laughs> And I'm sure there's many of us who like have been getting creative with how to create connection and nourishment in these times that we're all isolated. And if I can talk to Alexa in the morning and ask her the news and ask her the, the weather and have a conversation with her, if I'm getting something out of that and it's actually helping me, then what's so wrong with that, right? But what do we give up at the same time if we actually rely on uh, artificial beings who may one day be able to mimic empathy, who can already watch videos of us and see um, this is neutral. Oh, that person's expression just went sad. Oh, now they're feeling happy. Oh, now they're surprised. And we can actually develop technologies that can mimic and respond. And if we actually receive benefit from that, then what is so wrong with that, especially if it reduces costs, even if that means I'm out of a job. But on the flip side, as we know, and this is definitely more than three minutes, but thank you so much, Mikey, for getting me here. On the other side, as we know, at a base level, machine learning has implicit biases in it. And what happens with that when you take in the context of culture, oppression, uh, monetary gain, um, then we've got both what happens if we don't input moral um, coding to this, but also what happens if we do and who decides uh, what is the right response or what is the path to human flourishing. So it's quite complex. And as you can see, I've been like yeah. sitting in this for a long time and I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's so many angles Super how juicy. to encapsulate this. And I think, I think you've actually nailed some of the core, the core concerns there, Kat. So thank you so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks you, Mikey. Um, yeah, for sure. Can you repeat the question one more time? Yep. Um, what are the greatest potential benefits and dangers of AI facilitated psychedelic journeys? Excellent. Okay. Um, and I'm sort of multitasking. Okay. Got that going. And now uh, next, um, we are going to go to um, 
uh, Ariel. Uh, I think I didn't actually go in the right order somehow. <laughs> okay. so next, we're going to go to Ariel. So Ariel, uh, three minutes for you. Awesome, first of all, thank you, Kat. That was amazing. I just got the opportunity to meet Kat, and she is so insightful, and I love her so much. So thank you. So for me, my question is: Do both real meditation and technology enhanced meditation produce outcomes that are equally real? So for years, we've searched for things like enlightenment buttons and God helmets. The God helmet is something that can stimulate a part of your brain and give you the experience of God. But is that the same as the experience of God? Now, not everybody's turning to meditation for an experience of God. The aims of meditations are now many. Meditation to some people is a secular path to brain training or connecting to the self or presence in the moment. To others, meditation and those same actions is a spiritual path. Now, these days, we have a myriad of apps and technologies out there to help you meditate. Apps that use meditation for inspiration, for sleep, and performance that don't rely on Buddhist traditions or Buddhist principles. And that seems to be a good thing because many more people are being helped. So technology-enabled meditation gives broader access to more people, but access to what? To improve performance, to a sense of connection in something greater, or to a real path to something greater? Technologies for meditation can shorten the path or for beginners can just get you on it in the first place. Technologies for meditation include tools and augmentations that can help you train your awareness, hone your concentration, enhance your interoception, and make the invisible processes of meditation visible. They can give you glimpses into the states that you're trying to reach, and they can give you guideposts to get you there. Yesterday, we heard from Shinzen and Jay, and they told us about technologies that manipulate and stimulate the brain to enhance that path. So you kind of have to ask the question, does it still count if we take a shortcut? Even if in Shinzen's and Jay's solutions, you're not like zapping yourself to enlightenment, you're using the tool while you're being supported within a traditional practice and training. I really wonder, is there a magic that happens to sitting in a monastery on silent retreat that's missing when you enhance that path in a different way? Or is all meditation, even in its ancient forms, just a technology and a technology of its day? Technology that can be improved upon like all the technologies that have evolved in our changing human history. So is adding technology to meditation just another path? And is it a true path? Is it a denigration of the tradition or is it an enhancement of it? Is adding technology to meditation like sheer blasphemy, or is it simply an on-ramp that allows many more people to get on the path, whether they know they're on a path to something greater or not? Because meditation plus tech might just be the thing that actually saves our world. Now, I have for you a really important question in this time of authenticity, when what is authentic really matters, and we care, because we care about our role in healing ourselves and our world. And that leads me to this really juicy question, the question of authenticity to, to, to chew on. Do both meditation and meditation plus tech produce equally real outcomes and experiences? I would love to know what you think. Amazing, Ariel, you're, you're so awesome. So eloquently put, clearly someone who has been thinking about this, speaking about this and working on this um, firsthand for, for many, many years. So thank you, Ariel, beautiful. Um, Vince, you're up. Hi, everybody. Um, good to be here. And um, the question that I've I've been sitting with it's a, it's a little um, I'm still struggling to, to to formulate it, and so I'll I'll struggle a little bit in this few minutes, and just say that I'll start with a story, really. Um, one of my first, my first meditation teacher, he's an ER doctor uh, and, you know, trained, trained medical doctor. Um, many, and many of his friends and other people I met in my, my Dharma circles, my, my places where I was practicing meditation, learning from people. Also really highly trained scientists, medical doctors, engineers, uh, with, in Mikey's case, people, people that have a lot of training in rational thought and in, and in STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And all of these people in, in, in my years of practice, what I discovered with these people that were also really heavy meditators, people who would go on month, you know, multi-month long retreats, 
doing you know several hours a day of silent meditation all of these people reported experiencing some kind of magical phenomena as, as a regular part of their life and and it seemed like the the longer people are on these kind of contemplative paths like the buddhist contemplative path the more weird and magical and bizarre that things become um, same with the psychedelic path you know, there's a way in which the psychedelic path opens up these amazing mysterious experiences and, 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 and experiences that invite us to fundamentally question the, the core pre presumptions we have about reality. And these magical experiences are very much like that. They're profound inter experiences of interconnection with, with, uh, with the world, with each other, uh, where consciousness and culture and nature all seem to be part of one uh, interbeing, interprocess, uh, something that's happening all together. And there are moments when we, we sort of catch glimpses of that. We're not the separate you know, individual node of consciousness. We're, we're interconnected and, and we catch glimpses in these weird ways. Um, so if, if these advanced Buddhist practitioners, the ones I'm talking about, who are very rational and are sharing these experiences in private, talking regularly about this stuff, but aren't talking that much about it publicly because it's such a taboo still culturally to acknowledge as a rationally trained and educated person that you experience reading people's minds or uh, communicating with plants or, you know, maybe in your circles, if people hear this is not weird, but, you know, conventionally speaking, this is still very weird stuff. Uh, and yet there's so, there's so much here to, to me, this is the question what can we learn, especially uh, the, those of us that are kind of in the STEM fields, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics, you know, the, the fields where we're really building things and thinking about new, new ways of doing things. What can we learn from these kind of magicians, these mystics, these, these people who are having experiences that uh, our conventional models uh, of, of even of reality don't, don't quite explain that well. So what, what is it that we could learn from them if we took these things seriously, instead of just sort of saying there's over here is rationality and over here is magical thinking, which is bullshit. And these are the, this is the two choices. You know, what, what, is, what can we learn from the transrational experiences of and Buddhist just, magicians? Uh, a quick example, Vince, uh, yeah. what you mean by um, magical experience? Yeah, so I, I mentioned mind reading. That's one that I experience, you know, long, long meditation retreats where I'll suddenly see people's thoughts running through my mind and then they'll speak them out loud. That's a bizarre one. But well, even weirder, my, my meditation teacher the, the man, that I mentioned, Daniel Ingram, he goes on long silent retreats where he stares at a candle flame and just does this every day for like 12 hours. This is a, a, a very traditional form of concentration meditation. And there's a point at which if you're doing this for weeks at a time and your concentration is really good and you're just becoming totally absorbed in the candle flame, eventually it becomes, you become completely absorbed in this experience of this subtle uh, kind of light. And at, it, there's a certain stage of the practice where he describes from his own firsthand experience being able to call up hyper-realistic visual imagery. Like if you imagine you were sitting inside of like Adobe Illustrator and, and your thoughts and your intention and your, your feelings were directly connected to the visual interface and you could just feel and imagine this three-dimensional hyper-real imagery that you could rotate just like in a, in a, in a three-dimensional you know, Photoshop or Illustrator program. And that he had this capacity through training his attention this way for weeks at a time. You know, this is like, you don't just, <laughs> this takes a lot of training and, and decades before that. And, and, and I'm just like, whoa, that's, that's, that's a significant experience to have and report out on the fringes of weird experience that people can actually um, have this kind of relationship to visual phenomena and imagination that's that real. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so that's a good example. So Vince's question, what could technologists learn from Buddhist magicians? Jan uh, Janice, please, welcome. Hi, Mikey, pleasure to be here. Can you yeah. hear and see me okay? My uh, system crashed, I'm on my phone, thank goodness. You look great. Okay, I, I look a little psychedelic -y here, don't I? That's some some little. <laughs> so I 
miss part of your intro. I don't say the question till the very end, but I lead up to it. Is that right? Yeah. yeah why, why don't we, here, I'll read your question. Why don't you read it in the beginning and, and in the end? Just, just Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll do a bookend. All right. So my question is, uh, how do decriminalized settings versus clinics impact the spiritual and contemplative dimensions of the psychedelic experience? So this is focused on the psychedelic experience, but a particular part of it, the spiritual and contemplative division, dimensions. And I'm looking at juxtaposing the criminalized, decriminalized settings and clinics. And so I'll give you some background to lead up to see if you want to wrestle with this one. This is a big one. So there's three commonalities to meditation, contemplation, and psychedelics. First, they both polish the mirrors of the doors of perception where we can see contents of consciousness from multiple points of view, somewhat as Vince was just speaking about. Then they also both develop and polish a neutral compassionate witness capacity where we have a still awareness where we can observe our moment to moment experience neutrally and with compassion. And then third commonality, the experience of contemplation, uh, contemplative awareness and mystical experiences is a hallmark in the best outcomes in psychedelics for healing and well-being. So you want to have contemplative awareness and mystical experiences in order to get the best outcomes with psychedelics. So the doors of perception cleansing, developing a neutral witness, and having a mystical experience all leads to greater well-being when using psychedelics. So let's, let's get an overview of what's, what's this about decrim and research clinics. For those of you who aren't apprised of either or only a little bit of both, I'll give you the lowdown. Um, decriminalization involves cities and regions and sometimes states that will not prosecute possession of plants that are psychedelic in their effects but people can be prosecuted by larger governmental agencies, such as the federal government. So it's a partial right, not a full right. The research clinics that have been developing over the last 60 years are using psychedelics legally, both plants and psychedelic compounds in a contained legal setting approved by the FDA. However, it's got limitations. A, you're in a clinic, B, you have to have a medical diagnosis, and C, you have to be given therapy by two psychotherapists who are with you each and every moment. The first option of decrim is open to everyone in the region, and the second of medical clinics that are approved and legal by the FDA is only open to people who are clients. So how might each of these settings affect the probability of having a mystical or spiritual experience with a psychedelic? In decrim areas, grassroots methods to achieve spiritual experiences can be developed organically by the community. But even if collaborative, which they won't always will be, the general public will not necessarily know the value of meditation and neutral witnessing used in conjunction with psychedelics for best results in order to have a mystical or spiritual experience. So the general public needs education on this. Some very, very, very small subgroups of the general public public, some of whom are on this call right now, will know how to use these substances ceremonially. On the other hand, in the clinic, it's a stiff medical model and a structured setting that's not particularly collaborative. It's not created by equals, but the therapists do value mystical experiences and would like to see their clients have them to be neutral and objective. They will teach their clients how to optimize the probability of having a spiritual dimension in their experience. So neither the general public nor the medical clinics know universally enough about the importance and benefit of building community and group support for engaging in mystical experiences. So bada bang, given the limitations and benefits of each setting, decriminalized settings versus medical settings, what is the differential impact on people being able to focus on and cultivate mystical experiences with psychedelics? which is the key part of best outcome in psychedelics. Which setting is best and why? Great, um, beautiful. Thank you to our, our three presenters. Um, I'm going to share the, the questions so you can see them. And then I'm gonna describe what's gonna happen next. So these are our, uh, our four questions. 
Kat Connor, what are the greatest potential benefits and dangers of AI facilitated psychedelic journeys? Ariel Garten, do meditation and um, meditation plus technology produce equally real experiences and outcomes? Vince Horn, what could technologists learn from Buddhist magicians? And Dr. Janice Phelps, how do decriminalization settings versus clinics impact the spiritual and contemplative dimensions of the psychedelic experience? So here's our next step. Um, we are going to unhide in Meet PS. So everyone go to Meet PS, and what you will see in there is um, a, uh, there we go. Um, whoops, let me make this a reasonable size. What you will see in there um, is a portion on the bottom that says unpanel, right? And you're in that unpanel, you're gonna see the questions, right? Can we pre, uh, Joe, can you please, please relabel this button correctly? Um, you're not gonna hit this button. This button does not get pushed. What you're gonna do is you're gonna choose your question as a group of three. And then when you choose that question, you're gonna click on it. And then you're gonna put your question, you're gonna put your answer as a comment, right? So if I wanna answer question number three for Vince, I'm gonna click on it. And then I'm gonna put my response as a comment. So your goal in a group of three is to choose one question. And then you're gonna come up with one response to that question, you have about 13 minutes, okay? So now, what I'm gonna ask everyone to do is go to the um, material section, and you are gonna click the breakouts and unpanel link. And we are officially starting the breakouts portion of our unpanel. So hitting this link, breakouts and unpanel link, will begin to teleport you into Unpanel discussion land. I encourage, it's optional, but I encourage everyone to go. It's a really cool experience. It'll be quite valuable. You'll meet some amazing new people. Um, and um, go for it. You're gonna make me happy. The more people that do it, the happier I'll be. So if you wanna make me happy, go for it. So you click this link, breakouts and unpanel link. It's gonna be about 13 minutes in the group. All right, I see people uh, streaming out. And if, if anyone's lost or confused, you can unmute yourself and just give me a holler and I can, I can provide some guidance. Everyone good, figuring it out? Nanea says they can't unmute if they have questions. Oh, can we get permissions to unmute, please, John and Alora? Okay, now you can unmute. Any um, any uh, questions about how to navigate yourself into the um, unpanel? I I couldn't click the link, Mikey. Is uh, there another link that can get posted in the chat? Yeah, that's probably because you have an older version of Zoom. So oh. what you have to do um, is, um, which which link, you're talking about the link for Meet PS? The link that's- uh, No, the link that you shared on the screen. On the, in, in the Zoom chat, you mean? Mm -hmm. okay. Not in the Zoom chat, in the, on when you uh, clicked it on the screen, the bit.ly link. Okay. Oh yeah, so, so that, is in, that is in Meet PS. So if you look in the Zoom chat, if you look in the Zoom chat, um, yeah. The link right there, that's actually the link you're going to click. Okay, I'm going to the breakouts. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. And hi, Nanea. Good to see you. Hi. <laughs> I am similarly having trouble finding the link. <laughs> For sure. So the first step is you go to the Zoom chat and you're going to click that link. At the, the, it's the newest item in the Zoom chat. And that's going to ah. take you to the, the place where all the links are, and then you're gonna click the one that says breakout link. Okay, great. I missed that there was a new link. You'd think by the end of this conference, I would have gotten it. I've done it before, like how many no, others? It's a lot, it's a lot, it's complicated. We're like, you know, we're making life complicated here. <laughs> no, it's great, it's great. Okay, thanks. Yes, you got it. Anyone else? I'm happy to provide technical support.
Can we see the questions as they're coming in, or will you just? Yes. Uh, you, for sure, you can. So if you if you if you click the link in the Zoom chat. Yep. Um, and then you just navigate to the I, to the um, unpanel heading, the unpanel section. Um, that will allow you to look at questions as they come in. Although most of them, I think, will come in, um, you know, at the very end. a while into their discussion. My guess is the people that already sent theirs are kind of like not exactly following the instructions because <laughs> I'm up with it so fast, It'd be pretty quick. I like the answer yeah. to Ariel's question is just yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think yes, I think so. I don't want to mess up my access to the phone by trying to get into a chat because I don't find a button on my app. So I'm just going to hang out with you all. I'll rely on you, Mikey, to tell me what you see where relevant. Yeah, I will. Yeah, this is actually, it's actually, it's interesting. We Sometimes I find yes or no questions are actually um, more provocative. Like normally I would say it should be a how or what question mm -hmm. um, because yes or no questions can put people in yes or no thinking, um, but they can be more provocative and usually they like, create a kind of a stir people up and, and give them make longer responses. Um, so let's see if people actually just because people will debate. That's yeah. the, the result of yes or no questions sometimes. If they're willing to debate that that's the rub. I wish I could teleport, you know, like, <laughs> um, let's, yeah, I wish I could scan through. Um, for those, uh, if anyone at any point, for those folks that are here, if you want to join the breakouts, it's not too late. Um, if you need some information, you need to catch up. Um, so someone, a uh, Ralph, do you want to unmute yourself and, and we could talk about it? I got you. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm unmuting you, Ralph. <laughs> okay. <laughs> are we doing this at the same time? Somehow I can't unmute Ralph. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, I tried following the link three times. It takes me to join a new meeting. And That's in doing that, it blocked, it cut me out of the main session. That's what it's supposed to do. Well, no, it, out of the main session, but I wasn't linked to anything. Oh, so, it, so you click the link and then, it, and then it says you're going to a new meeting. And then what happened? Uh, I lost this main group and That's nothing right. came in. I had no choices. Um, so you were just sort of floating in, in, in empty, empty space. Correct. Um, oh, interesting. I haven't heard that one before. Um, you know, in some ways that's one of the goals of the, of the, of the, that would be like uh, the ultimate goal. So, um, <laughs> uh, could have been a mystical experience, but <laughs> no. <laughs> I do have a comment that I haven't been able to put in. Okay. There seems to be a great crossing over between the idea of technologies and psychedelic technologies for therapy versus self growth. And I think there's probably a profound difference between the two. Um, That's for sure. But I don't see that being separated out. Hmm. Um, what do I do for myself? And what do I do for my for my patients? Mm -hmm. uh, I've also not heard any kind of examples of what kind of technologies people are using, other than indirectly using Muse. Um, but all, all the thing on uh, psychedelic and technology, I'd love to know what technologies people are using, uh, and I'm not hearing that. Cool. I'm going to op open it up to our, our unpanelists if anyone wants to uh, anyone wants to respond. Uh, I'll take on the first uh, question, Ralph. I think um, the at least my positioning, my question. I did it in the medical model. Uh, I'm a psychologist and training therapist, so I wanted to get at that edge. But the real difference between well-being goals versus healing goals is that we're, we're, um, we're not likely to have um, an easy journey in either case, whether we have trauma or depression or anxiety or not. But if our intention is set for well-being or questions about creativity or team building, something along those lines, 
we sh we often will have the same kind of landscape psychedelic that psychedelically that we would if we have medical symptomology we're trying to heal but the intensity of it is often different but you might know of that anyway but i didn't broach that because really the people in decrim world are probably doing it primarily for well-being and some for personal healing and in the case of vets healing for themselves and groups from the trauma of having been in war uh, so there's a, a great variety but i think the mystical experience piece is a key whether you're trying to get uh, well healed or you're trying to get into your own creativity or well-being but i wonder what you think i was just gonna was a... go ahead sure cat go ahead <laughs> building on what you're you're saying janice which i think is really true it also seems to me that the importance of set and setting and the range of additional tools necessary to facilitate uh, deeper healing with more um, serious issues like trauma, um, chronic depression, anxiety, things like that, that I think require, seem to require more significant intervention through the set setting and therapy. Um, and I can just be really transparent in sharing my own process of, you know, having come to um, this work, both as a therapist and with medicines with complex PTSD and what was required for me at that time to um, really be able to benefit from and integrate those experiences feels really different um, for me now because um, I'm in a really different place in my life. So um, that's, that was my thinking on the, the first one. I'm curious back to, back to him. I forget what your name was that asked the question. Ralph, I think. Ralph. Ralph, are you still here? Oh yeah, I'm still here. So what do you think? You're a clinician as I understand it, right? I worked in drug abuse, youth counseling, crisis counseling centers all the way through college, so back in the 1960s. I remember first trying, creating audio tapes for psychedelic experiences without drugs back in the early 70s. Um, Went on, left that, and I'm a physician. I do primary care. I do an occasional QEEG. I do some pulse electromagnetics, uh, TDCS, TACS, pulse infrared on the side. It's not something the insurance companies cover. Uh, I use a lot of electrical stim using alpha stim, probably oh, over a few thousand treatment sessions with a really good effect. Um, but there it's usually from the point of view of trying to take somebody, a healing component. So I'm directing it as a therapist. So mm -hmm. it's very much me evaluating my patient and deciding here's what I think the person needs mm -hmm. and taking them there. Um, how I approach that for myself, for self-growth is um, profoundly different question, but I haven't really heard people distinguishing between the two. Um, It'd be really exciting to research that. Like what if MDMA or mescaline or LSD or psilocybin do get rescheduled? What would the interface of some of those modalities you're using be like for someone either before the session, during the session or after the session? Would it help promote the direction the mind, body, spirit wants to go in for that person. Be really interesting. We haven't had the money, time, enough people wanting to research that, but you might be in a good position to do so yourself. Yeah. Eventually, eventually. <laughs> That's sort of my interest long-term. Mm -hmm. I'm curious while, while we've got all these amazing folks here, is there anyone else who's hanging out um, as long as we're here that has a, question for for Kat, for Vince, for Ariel, for Janice. Great idea, Mick. Okay. And Mikey, I sent you a little note. Okay, cool. I have a question, Mike. For the for Kat 
I would like to learn more about the Aurin project and how it's possible to get involved with it. I read Pala and I really like Pala. Mm. I'm curious to know which, which, what kind of ways it's possible to collaborate with you, mm. the group. Yeah, thanks for the question, Jonas. And I want to be really mindful and respectful of the container of what we're here to do um, right now. Um, but in reading, we will call it Paula, you see some of the questions that we attempt to address in it, which include what does it look like when we interface um, technology with a psychedelic psychotherapy, um, not with any answers, but with some of the, the questions around quandaries. Um, but a really easy way is drop me a private line and we can connect and, and you can sign up on our website and, you know, one of our specific projects, North Star, that we're incubating right now is having a town hall, if that area in particular interests you, next Friday, uh, May 8th, which you can find out about on our website as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jonas. Um, I'm curious if any of, we actually we only have a couple minutes left. Um, I, I, let's see, they're going to tell, and um, um, and apologies to you, Ariel. I'm, I'm just made a note to our to our team. Um, Does not matter. They all answered the. We don't know which question they answered, but it's okay. We can speak to both of them. Yeah. Okay, Ariel. I I gotta say, I love the glasses, the lipstick, and the beautiful <laughs> mural behind you. It's so spot on. You meld into it and meld out. I'm loving it. Thank you. Great artistry. Yeah, it's a work of art. So actually, both are by the same artist, my mother. <gasps> no oh, kidding. Well, oh, me it's gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Cool. Both. <laughs> um, let's see. I think we have people coming back now. Uh, let me let me double check. Yeah, we're coming back, Mikey. Okay, okay. Well, welcome back. Um, we've got about one minute left in some rooms. Um, you know, actually, as we're coming back, maybe maybe we can start. Does any one of our unpanelists have a, a response to any of our other unpanelists' question? Ooh. Wow. Wow. I have a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a question for Ariel. Um, sure. Ariel, yeah. So I, I was curious about your back, like your contemplative background before you started Muse. What was your kind of personal experience with the kind of? I, I'm not sure. Let's just use consciousness sure. side yeah. of things. So I came into this as someone who was trained as a neuroscientist, working in neuroscience research labs, and as a psychotherapist coming out of really gestalt and CBT lineages. So I was a clinician that would be using meditation with my patients. I was a neuroscientist in investigating the brain from different angles. Um, and I was a totally shitty meditator. I was <laughs> and I really honestly couldn't do it effectively myself. My brain would do the thing that all our brains do, which is bounce all over the place. I get frustrated by myself at, at myself and wouldn't be effective and uh, knew the value of it and still couldn't engage the practice. And so as we started building Muse, we started with an early brain computer interface technology and we tried to figure out you know, what is it that we could best do with this brain computer interface tech. And we recognized that it was to allow people to get an insight into their own mind. And the best application for this was meditation. And from there you know, began my real contemplative journey um, understanding how to apply technology to meditation, understanding the, the deep background of meditation, which we're all still learning. You know, we, we've all only gone so far in our journeys. Um, and now looking at literally millions and millions of sessions of meditation using EEG and collaborating with researchers on that. So um, thank you, Ariel. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start transitioning us now to um, begin looking at um, what's coming in as responses. I'm gonna ask our audience, because I just love this um, idea of, of crowdsourcing um, the, the, the 
um, the, the state of the collective from the collective, the interest of the collective. So if you could upvote the responses that you are excited about, so look through the questions, check them out, um, and do some voting in there. Um, so you can help us decide what, what is best to talk to these folks about. Um, so I'm gonna start with, um, with Kat. Um, so, so this is a, um, all right. I'm a believer. That was a really great session. Oh, great, great, Greg. Thank you. Um, so, um, okay. So here, here we go. Um, so this is a, um, a question about uh, both risks and benefit. So risks, imagine the worst psychedelic trip you have ever had guided by, by AI for the <laughs> purpose of torture or information extraction. Mm -hmm. So almost, almost like the AI could create the ultimate bad trip. Um, and then benefit, hyper-targeted experience to get you the trip you need to get to a particular insight, like the ultimate, you know, intelligent, you know, as, as Adam Ghazali called closed loop system to kind of get you to that, that right spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, of course the first part reminds me of MK ultra, right. And early studies looking into the application of psychedelics for, um, you know, military benefit or tactic. And I think at the heart of really both of these is the question around, um, power, and who has access to these technologies, uh, these combined technologies, and what are the intended uses, and then what are the, the ways that they're programmed based on um, these deep belief networks that actually show up in deep learning. There's a whole belief structure, so what are actually the, the values implicit in any of that that are informing the outcomes? Beautiful. And actually, this leads to the, to the response for Ariel, um, because this is, I think, a lot of what comes up in these conversations around tech is kind of like, who's, who's designing it? Who's building it? And, and what's their intention? And what's the sort of the DNA of the tech? And so, Ariel, your question is, your response is, um, so I'd say yes, as long as tech settings are set for well-being, love, and spiritual evolution. And what I'll add on, on top of that is like, like, how do we do that? How, like, how do we make sure that the, the settings, you know, it's not a switch, right? It's clearly not, it's not that easy. How do we make sure that the settings are set for well-being, love, and spiritual evolution? Mm -hmm. Well, and we also look at it, that fact that it wasn't that long ago that um, conversion therapy was outlawed. Um, so, and hearing personal stories of people who've come forward about um, their psychedelic therapist using psychedelics to help them be converted from being gay to straight, right? So right, this right. shows up all the time. Totally. And where, where are you at with that, Ariel? Yes, yeah, so this is an incredibly important question. And, you know, in some ways, traditional meditation, if you take this path, you will eventually increase your concentration, which will, you know, eventually start to release you from your own stories, which will eventually give you a sense of something greater and a loss of ego, and you will eventually go down this path. It, that seems to be what we've seen evolving over 2000 years. When you start short circuiting it and you have this technology that can, that can guide you or enhance you on that path, so long as it's set on that path, likely the outcome will be the thing that we've always seen with traditional meditation. Um, um, if you, are using the same technology, but for different ends, then you potentially have yourself a problem. You know, if you're now using technology to enhance your creativity or, you know, decrease your amygdala, oh, by the way, you know, decrease in amygdala activity can also look like psychopathy. Uh, it turns out psychopaths have very, very low amygdala activity, which is something that we as meditators aim for as we shut down our reactivity to things that we needn't be reacting to. So designing this technology with the hope for positive outcomes is key. And kind of all you can do is try to put guardrails on it. I early on created something called the Center for Responsible Brainwave Technologies, which create, created a set of principles 
um, and pillars that we hoped everybody in the industry would adhere to so that yeah, EEG technology was never used to decrease people's safety, efficacy, privacy, or agency. Um, so, you know, the same EEG technology that can enhance spiritual experiences and, trans and transcendent experiences could also be used to read your brain in ways that aren't necessarily meaningful, you know, helpful and salubrious to you. Um, when guided meditations are a great way to, you know, ensure that principles of love and connection and positivity are, are the ones that technology is being used for because they guide you into a particular intention and they guide you into a particular state of heart and mind. Um, but, you know, the question that you asked is a great one. Like, how do we, how do we keep these settings on love and hope and humanity? And one way is by ensuring that people who are creating them are oriented towards love and hope and humanity. And another way is hoping that the people whose hands they fall into are also oriented towards love and hope and humanity. And uh, hoping that we can create some large kill switch <laughs> if they're used in the wrong ways. Yes, amazing, Ariel, thank you. Um, uh, I need uh, the audience's help, by the way, because I, I realize I can't multitask. I can't listen and read the questions at the same time. So I'm just gonna trust that you're gonna upvote the ones that are good. And that way um, I can just trust you and just read the one at the top, which, is, which I'm about to do, I have not read it. <laughs> so I can't, I can't screen this or moderate it. So here we go for, for Vince. And, and uh, next I'll have a Janice, so you can beat me to the punch uh, crowd. Um, so uh, thanks Gino for voting, I see you here. <laughs> um, so, uh, so to Vincent's question, what could technologies learn from Buddhist magicians? Um, develop tech from the heart, from a state of awareness, must go inside, be aware of masculine, feminine dynamic, be careful of the role of capital accumulation, how to uncover the window, um, in parentheses, peak altered state experiences to show people where the door is that they have to walk through, how to draw people into the path of growth, how to use the realizations that come from meditations, etc., and build around them how to empower others and give gifts to the greater consciousness. Cool. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, I love, I, I, I love this response because for me, it feels like um, it's pulling from what I also appreciate most about, about the Buddhist tradition. Um, some of it, <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't like, but one of the things I love is, is this, uh, you know, the point about being careful about capital accumulation, you know, it's a, it's a very radically different um, economic model. It's a generosity based model and has been for 2,500 years. It's a very unusual economic model. It arose in the Indian caste system as a totally, uh, you know, different thing it was completely off the radar and they did did economics differently? The monks lived on generosity. So, so to me, that this is a very interesting question. How do we bring generosity um, and that spirit and that ethical orientation into um, technology? And I love the masculine feminine dynamic. You know, my wife often says, you know, she, this is so, so, so this is also an excuse of hers about why she, she doesn't do things with her tech <laughs> but it's you know she's like i can tell you know the male mind uh, designed all of this because i have no fucking clue how to use it <laughs> and uh you know i think that's really important um that the book the biases that you know that um cat you were mentioning um uh, the uh, the way that, that those biases get code encoded into uh technology um so yeah i thought this was a beautiful response and um, I, 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 I think I largely agree. And I, I think the point about developing tech from the heart, from, from, a place of, from a place of awareness, for me, I'd say, yeah, like technologists getting as deep in as they can um, is, is, is the best thing to do from, from my point of view, because, you know, so many of the, of, of the challenges, the problem solving of building technology is about running up against our limitations of perspective. And, meditation practice, you know, consciousness hacking, going deep, you know, whatever way you're doing it is to me, this is the only way to really reconfigure those fundamental presuppositions, you know, and, and to be able to have a mind that's open, you know, that's really truly open to considering something different. Uh, so yeah, thank you for that, Tim. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Um, and 
Uh, I, I also want to say, in this process, um, with about 15 minutes left, unpanelists, you can you can throw in for any conversation that's happening. So it's a kind of a for all unpanelists, it's a it's a free for all. So if anyone has any other comments on that or or ongoing, please just just chime in. But if not, I think I just want to note um, the similarities. It seems like especially with uh, Vince Ariel and and my question, just how much is similar at the heart of these issues that um, I think have been in existence from time immemorial. <laughs> There's an interesting comment in the, in the side chat here, because technology is developed by human, I think, so it will never go beyond our true human potentials. And that kind of speaks between all three of our questions, but it also takes us back to the idea that meditation was inherently just as created by humans, we think, also. So how is that different than any technology we're creating today? Yeah, I, I uh, the more I think about it, the less I'm able to actually find a, a clear bold distinction between what we would call a technology, what we would call a meditation practice, or what we would call any other form of human expression. Um, the definitions are useful, um, but the, the true boundaries are actually quite hard to find, um, as, as all boundaries when you look, when you look close enough. Um, so Mikey, I, I'd like to jump in about that. I don't know how to label this, yes. but I heard a woman at another conference say, we're developing technologies for meditation and consciousness uh, development. And we've had the breath. The breath of is, is a technology. But she said, I think we can do better than the breath. And it chilled me <laughs> to hear that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but I, and I'm not clear why. So mm. it's been a puzzlement to me because the breath, is the basis for all spiritual practices will, worldwide that I know of. So for someone to contend we could do better than the human in-breath and out-breath, it is a puzzlement. But I'm sharing that with you as perhaps a demarcation of something where I tech feel, can't go. I feel dissonant too when, when I hear that. The one thing I'll offer is there's the breath and then there is the instruction to notice the sensation of the breath at the end of the nose, for example. Mm -hmm. The instruction is a technology. Mm -hmm. Without that instruction, skillfully applied at the right time to the right person in the right place in the right context, the breath's um, potential to transform is untapped. Yeah, yeah I, I, I totally agree with you. It's very parallel to doctors saying, we don't heal anything. We optimize the healing capacity of the body and mind to do its own healing. And we get things out of the way or assist it, but we can't, it's, it's got its own life. So it's similar. The, um, in my observation, most of the dissonance that people feel with technology, what it boils down to is an innate recognition of the disharmony between the technology we're creating and life's natural rhythms. Mm -hmm. meaning the ability for the body, for example, to heal itself is a natural capacity of life itself, the generative capacity mm -hmm. for that. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's, for me, that's often what the dissonance boils down to. Yeah, good point. I like that. Mm -hmm. Does that take us back to the question of AI, something that is itself generative? Perhaps does that solve the dissonance, but yet it seems to create more dissonance when we think about AI being generative? Mm -hmm. And yet that generativity is still built from the initial building blocks, no matter how much it transforms or changes, it's like our own DNA. I mean, that's a whole other piece, right? Can we actually change our DNA? But whatever is missing there, um, or whatever this is in coded in the seed will still inform what's possible. I, I, I've got, I've got one, I've got one thing to add on here. If it, if it, if it, Please time. Yeah, the, the, I'm just thinking, you know, going back into the old Buddhist repository, there's an interesting thing in the Tibetan tradition where they make a distinction in practice between what they call the generation phase and the completion phase of practice. And in the generation phase, you're like doing stuff. You're generating, you know, the image of a, of a, of a deity or you're you know, you're doing mantras or you're, you're doing something where you're generating some kind of feelings and sounds and you're, you're, you're doing something. And then the completion phase, you let go. 
of all of the doing and the generating and the instructions and all of it. And you just, mm. this is it. And I think personally that there's that, that dimension of completion, you can't ever alter that with technology or instructions. Like there's some dimension to this, which is unalterable. And then there is what you said, the instructions, there's the actual uh, generation. Like there's what are you generating in the space of primordial awareness? What is it that we're evolving toward? Beautiful. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, Bring us back to one of the responses. This is now in Janice's uh, uh, question. So Janice's question was how to decriminalization settings versus um, clinics impact the spiritual and contemplative dimensions of the psychedelic experience. Phrase like a true academic. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a mystical experience. Uh, so here's uh, the, uh, the top response. A mystical experience has been, uh, and this is uh, from Lori, uh, Pinkleton. Thank you, Laurie. A mystical experience has been achieved in the clinical setting, even though you would think the setting is a hindrance. So the setting may be more related to the guide and a secure feeling. Does that make sense? Did I, should mm -hmm. I read that? Um, yeah. I think the opportunity for integration of the mystical experience is probably the most important. And would this be as accessible in both the decriminalization and the decriminalized and clinical situation? Sure enough, Lori, I, I believe you could. Um, if we could parlay a way to teach the general public about being a witness, a compassionate witness for someone else's process and know when they're getting into trouble and when to stay out of the way when it looks like they're getting into trouble, but they actually need to experience some of that darkness within them. Therapists like to think, you know, it takes high level of training and phrasing questions like I just did that Mikey called me out on as a professor. But I think this can be taught. Altruism is, I think, a natural sentiment and capacity in human beings. Compassion is natural. But we, we don't have an infrastructure for being able to train and teach the general public about that. Shamanic cultures endeavor to do that. But often there's only one or two or so, a handful of people who are recognized as having a certain skill level. That's where I brought up that piece about community. If a community is uh, uh, holding themselves in community, beloved community or otherwise, they honor those who have capacity to draw out the benefit for individuals and the group to go forward and become better human beings, kinder to each other, more creative. We, we don't have an infrastructure for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's invent a technology for that. Mm -hmm. Like how, how are we going to change up our, our rather competitive fear-based species mm -hmm. to be able to do what Lori's talking about, each and every one of us? I like the idea. Mm -hmm. you know, building, uh, building on what you're saying, Janice, I think this the two words that really come to mind is, is education and culture. And I think we've been seeing a real shift in culture, but what it makes me think of is it reminds me of back when I was um, a family therapist working in residential treatment with teens and we ran a family program. And for many of the families, it was the first time they were exposed to therapy of any kind and they were brought to their knees to do it, right? Having their child be in you know, being in residential treatment. And so we would have multiple families, up to 40 people in the room, introducing ideas like nonviolent communication, rites of passage, and holding that work as a rite of passage for not just their child, but the whole family. And you could probably see over time that there was a culture change, not just within the family, but through the recognition and practice with other families of new ways of being. And I think that's my, my hope, right, is through the context of the medical model, as well as decriminalization, that we have more access to build out education and shape culture in ways that support us to relate with one of, with one another in ways that heal more than harm. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Josiah Royce who affected and influenced Martin Luther King 
And Royce talks about when we want a world like Connor was just speaking about, um, it's frustrating when it seems like such a gap between where we're at now and where, we're, where, where we want to go. And he suggests this, when I cannot find the community that I want to see enlivened in the future, we need to take steps to create it. And if there is no evidence of its existence at all, then the rule to live by is act so as to hasten its coming. So if there's no evidence of its existence, the rule to live by mm -hmm. is to act so as to hasten its coming, which puts a big push of uh, intentionality and integrity behind this, that we really would need to start acting as if we didn't want the kinds of things you were calling out and we want something else, but we need to hasten its coming by acting toward it, which gets a little bit at that uh, discomfort we had about the breath and the technologies, but maybe a rule of thumb like that could help us better than AI, psychedelics, or even meditation. Mm -hmm. Who's not, who's to know till we try it. Awesome. Thank you, Janice. That is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful way to end. Act so to, uh, as to hasten its coming. May we all act so as to hasten its coming.